Today I want to offer a talk about, uh, well I don't really know what it's about. I know it's about wisdom <laughs> and about consciousness and connection and <laughs> I have to think of a title before the end. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'll lead into it on a couple of levels. One is um, I'll share this uh, little story which is a Mahayana story as quite often my stories are, not all of them. But this is a story, um, it's a story about both uh, the, the deepest samadhis that one could, the deep levels of samadhis that one can enter and at the same time about this discriminative wisdom that is also present in our lives. And the story goes that the Buddha was invited to a meeting with other Buddhas. <laughs> I know from Theravada is a little hard to... <laughs> but anyway, from the Mahayana there's... Uh, come in, there's some, some chairs here in the front. There's some chairs down here in the front. Um, and he was there and just also was his uh, disciple, Manjushri. And Manjushri is said to be the... Uh, uh, the, the great wisdom bodhisattva, the great wisdom personification in Dharma. And uh, he is also said to have been a teacher of all the Buddhas. <laughs> and so Manjushri enters and just as he enters, all the other Buddhas are going back to where they came from. And the Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, is sitting there next to him is a young woman, deep in, in samadhi, deep in a deep st state of inner stillness. And uh, Manjushri is a little jealous. And he says, well, how does this young woman get to sit clo so close to my teacher, to the Buddha? And the Buddha says, well, if you can wake her out of her samadhi, ask her. <laughs> and so Manjushri he clicks his fingers a few times, which is the normal way to bring someone out of samadhi, and she doesn't move. So he takes her up to the highest Brahmin realm and gathers the Brahmins to help, and they all have a go, and still she stays in this very... Oh, we have a... Well, one moment in this very um, deep state of meditation. So, well, we have, to, we have to pause here so you can... And so, the Buddha says, hundreds of thousands of realms down there, you will find a bodhisattva by the name of discriminative wisdom. There's also another name, and I think it's called Alluring Light. But she is just a fledgling practitioner on the path, a fledgling bodhisattva. Ask her to come and help. And in an instant she was there, clicked a finger once, and this young practitioner was out of her samadhi and returned to her realm. And Manjushri is very puzzled by this. You know, how does this discriminative wisdom bring such a deep state of stillness and practice back into this light, back into this present. So this is a story that uh, we have in our Zen tradition to contemplate. There's many aspects to this story. Well, one is, of course, you know, Manjushri himself in his completeness of wisdom and clarity and light is no other than that state, that unabiding, that empty state of non-duality. He is that itself. So 
to take something of the same nature and try and extract it from something of the na same nature, it, it doesn't work. So this is a, an area of contemplation when we practice meditation very deeply and we start to go into these deep states of meditation, deep states of samadhi. Where does that then fit back into our life? The life that's full of discriminations and judgment and clarifying is all very important. That is another wisdom in itself, the wisdom of how to live and work and communicate in this world requires, when done well, it is wise actions, wise speech, loving connections. When not done well, it's very harmful. So it does require the development of wisdom and this bodhisattva of discriminatory wisdom, the fledgling bodhisattva who's, or practitioner who's just stepping out has already distinguished what is beneficial and what is not and has developed a lot of power from this. So she could enter the highest realm in a flash and at the same time be very present to help and guide us in this very ordinary world. This realm, well I shouldn't say ordinary, but <laughs> this realm that is full of colour and shapes and multiplicities of energy and understanding, creativity. And so there are many commentaries to this. This person and that person has something to say about it. And I'll just share a few of a few of them, just a couple. And all of them sort of point out that Manjushri is has the capacity to cut illusion, has the wisdom to clear separation and discrimination. That's he often is seen with a sword, this sword of slicing away of that I've talked about before. And with uh, the samadhi and the illusion of, uh, of being separate always drops away when wisdom, when Manjushri is present, when samadhi is present, when you go into deep stillness, everything unites and separations fall away. But then we have this, uh, her name was Momo, this, uh, this, um, or his name, this uh, fledgling bodhisattva. He is far, as far away from the Buddha as you can imagine. You know, he's here with us in our very ordinary capacities. But Momo is also the principle of identi identifying and, uh, and discursive, clarifying, So together with Manjushri, who is the principle of non-differentiations, we have one of differentiation, the other of non-differentiation. Where does that fit for us? How does that work? Works very well, actually. One great sage by the name of Sojo said in a verse, along with me on my journey, Ashakyamuni, the Tathagata, Manjushri and, and Momo. I enjoy the mountain spring and visiting one truth after another. One, as one thing arises, being with that, samadhi arises, experiencing that depth and emptiness and fulfillment and stillness and clarity and when our eyes are connecting, our ears are 
connecting to a sound or sight or touch or taste, then in those subtle connections, those momentary connections, then be clear about it. Distinguish what is happening here. I'll give another little story that'll take us a bit deeper here. I have said this, I've done this teaching many years ago, but I'm not going to give the whole teaching, but just the very first paragraph, which is about a young ox herding boy. An ox herder, as you would see in much of Asia, is often a young child who is expected to look after that ox so he doesn't run away. But in this case, the ox gets loose and he bolts. And the young boy is running after him and as he runs after him, he ends up in this thicket of forest and climbing weeds and thickets and of, of, of um, prickly brackets and so forth. And he doesn't know where to go, he doesn't know what to look has no idea where to find this ox. The mountains, they say, are high and the valleys are deep and there's rushing water running down in the rivulets and rivers. But he pursues, he continues, just running on a sheer fear of the repercussion of loss. Much of us do this <laughs> in our daily lives. <laughs> maybe we've missed something, maybe we've forgotten something, maybe we've lost something. And here, of course, the ox is the mind as it develops in the story, but at this stage he doesn't even know what the ox is and what to do with it, but he has a job to have it nearby. And as he goes on, he gets very weary as we do in life, day by day. We finish the end of the day and we're very weary because our minds are exhausted, our energy is depleted. And in this weariness, as the sun is going down, it is said, he seats himself down on a rock, exhausted, no longer looking, no longer thinking, and in that moment, he hears the sound of a warbler, a little bird that has a beautiful sound. And his concerns disappear and he, for a few moments, is in a trance with this sound. He wakes up with this sound and his energy comes back his alertness comes back, his seeing gets sharp and his ears. So what has happened here? His discriminatory wisdom has penetrated quite a lot of ignorance. The alluring to this sound, this new, fresh, clear, beautiful sense of hearing and connecting. It awakens everything else within him. For a short time, I'm sure there's a seat somewhere down in here, just over in the corner here. And he, uh, with his new, renewed energy, he suddenly, his eyes see more sharply. He's recollected what he is looking for. And what does he see? A broken branch here, some trodden grass there. He sees the signs, a few little signs of where that ox has run to. And that's what happens in our meditation. We come in, we're very confused, 
Everyone runs away to retreat to just get on top of themselves and get life in order and so I can control it a bit better and, you know, <laughs> have a little bit more empowerment. <laughs> I had um, a wonderful Korean man come to help. He offered to lay some stone tiles in the hall. And he came, his effort was impeccable. He and, a, 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 and an offsider, his, um, his man who works with him, beautiful job, you know, so thorough, so careful, so competent. And I said, oh, you know, this is three times up and down. You're so generous. Well, the third time was before because they forgot a tool. Then he thought, well, I'll come back and put some sealant on the stone too. And uh, he was, I said, you know, uh, you have so much selfless effort. He said, oh, no, I'm really hoping. <laughs> he was very honest. <laughs> he said, I'm really hoping. And then I said, oh, okay, here it comes. I'm really hoping that um, you will start a, a, a Sunday class for Koreans when the hall's finished. So all this... Energy has a little, you know, a little sting at the little hope at the end, a big hope actually, um, <laughs> has an intention, has a discriminatory intention. But, and, you know, we all do it. We all, you know, have this bartering going on in our life. <laughs> I come, come here early on Sunday morning so I can get a little, wake up a little and then deal with the rest of the week. <laughs> we have some expectation. But how the difference between our greedy expectation and a discriminatory wisdom, yes, it's clarifying and defining and doing all the rest of it, has intention. The other's full of intention, this is full of intention too. But what it is doing is if it's done with a higher mind, with a developed mind, it is doing with a selfless, compassionate, generous interest. It is doing something to benefit. And that's how the Bodhisattva develops. They may actually develop the wisdom quite early. Meditation can develop a very sharp mind. But the development of our actions in the right direction takes a bit more. And as, going back to the other story, as the boy starts to see where this ox has gone, the signs of this big beast who's absolutely having a ball in his freedom, just like our minds. If we haven't learnt to skillfully train them a little bit, you know, they're everywhere and doing everything and having a ball. And slowly as we see what happens in this story, he first sees, just as the night is going dark and he can't go any further, he can't look any further, he looks up in the black sky and he sees the white horns. Ah, he's found him. So he... he decides to just stay nearby and rest, knowing that also the ox is probably resting. And in the morning, early in the morning, he starts to use other discriminative wisdom that comes from a heightened excitement of discovery. When we start in meditation and we get a little insight, we get very excited. 
very joyful. Wow. Starting to understand. Things start to fall in place. Oh, they do that because of that. I do that because of we start to see those connections of how our actions unfold. This is where this, that wisdom is starting to grow. And he watches the ox. He wakes up early and first he sees, then in the morning he sees the rump. It's a great big rump. He's only a little boy. And he's having to think, how can I catch this ox? How can I get trap it to get the noose around the head? So how can I stay with my restless mind and get hold of it? How can I train my mind enough or, or trick my mind enough so I can keep it in one place? He's very, his wisdom's getting very sharp because he's worked very hard to get to this point. He then sees how the ox is moving. He's staying very still. And then while the ox has got his head down and his mind's into his tucker, into his food, he quickly throws the noose over his head before the ox even knows he's there. So he outwits the ox. This is that sort of discriminative, clever wisdom. Not yet very refined. And over the story, as it develops, he has to bring the ox, get the ox back into the paddock. He has to tether the ox. But he knows if he tethers it, he learns as he's going along. If he tethers it too close, then the ox is likely to break the, the rope. So he gives it a lot of leeway so he can watch how he moves and what he does. And it goes on to tell you how he trains the ox until he can ride the ox home. And this is what we do in meditation. It's one thing to learn how to still the mind, how to meditate, how to find peace. Mind you, for most of us, it's rather short-lived. Maybe one or two take a little longer retreat, but another, how to come out of that non-discriminatory into the world, how to bring ourselves back and deal with our family, our issues, all those things I see as not doing it my way. How do I grow my mind? How do I grow my heart to embrace and bring that samadhi back down into this world we live? It is developing that compassion. Developing that respect, that love and kindness along with our wisdom, together. It's the respect of this body, the respect of how this body connects and communicates that gives us the inspiration and the strength to go much deeper into meditation. I remember when I was in my hermitage, and I sometimes share little clippets from that time where I lived in several hermitages, but one in, for a long period of time. And life was very much like living in a samadhi. My body was very light. My mind was very light. My habits, I didn't have to think, oh, I don't want to get up this morning. I was this at this time, that at that time. So life was very smooth. 
There weren't too many. There were always little obstructions, you know. Maybe the pheasant interrupted my meditation this morning. Or the, the big mountain cat, you know, when he's cry, made me get up and have to give him some cheese or milk or something. <laughs> These very subtle little, you know, things that can happen in your retreats that disturb you. Somebody breathing too heavily next to you or, or someone else just looking at you with a scowly face <laughs> sets you off for the day in not feeling so great. But these still underlying that over a long period of retreating and, and living in a certain way of simplicity, habit, good habits, timely habits, little speech, you know. I talked my, I talked mostly to my, uh, my guang, my, it's like a lyrebird, pheasant, or my little uh, taramji, which is a little squirrel. We, we had nice conversations daily and give him a few peanuts for doing it. <laughs> but in this simplicity, there didn't seem to be, the waters weren't rippled very much. It was only when I made a decision to, a conscious decision to come back to live in Australia that the suffering came. I could feel it within two weeks, my whole body changed. Imagine that young girl coming out of a deep samadhi sitting next to the Buddha and coming back into the world of all its complexities and discriminations. How she must have felt. Great insight, great. As you go into deep samadhi, there's great insight as you enter and tremendous insight of knowing it's not so, Im not so permanent as you come out. <laughs> Bliss has a finite life. But then to sit there in this world and do nothing is a very, in my view, uh, a mistaken way of practice. It doesn't allow you to grow in compassion. It doesn't allow your wisdom to develop that very important discernment of what is beneficial for you and others. Now, I can't say the name, I don't think, very well. Who is the very famous Chinese artist? Yi Wei He? Yi He Wei? Ai Wei Wei. Well, I knew I was close. <laughs> Ai Weiwei. I was listening to an interview, it's a very good interview with him. Extraordinary man, gone through the tremendous cultural oppression in China, but still had that capacity to remain conscious of what was he felt him very important to bring and spread and communicate with others what is happening. And it continued through his art. It continued in his uh, relationships in America where he learnt many, especially, you know, um, many things in the way of medium, media and medium, to communicate to a lot of people. And more recently, it's very interesting, and he's very still, when you look at him, move, you see his face, only his mouth moves. His face doesn't move. Very strong. And he made a documentary on refugees. He went all over the world interviewing and connecting with refugees. He showed how he'd give them his passport and say, I'll take yours. <laughs> so just in little ways to make 
that connection with us all to share that unity, that humanity. Deep, deep compassion there. Deep, deep wisdom and compassion in action. When we have, um, when we have, uh, you know, moments of our consciousness that are coming out all the time, we often think it's, you know, the mind is just this big light, you know, of, but they're not. They're just little tiny moments of experience that almost burn as soon as they come out. But they're coming and and falling away or coming going back to where they came from, depending what school of Buddhism you're in. <laughs> in one school it's they're called beaches and they, they collapse back into each other and they're rising and falling. But for the consciousness which relies on every moment one of those comes out, there is a contact, there's a connection. They don't all fulfill it. There is a sense or a feeling, a subtle knowing. It's like being in a dark room, but sort of having a sense where a wall may be or have a sense of what it is you're standing on, a subtle sense. It's like in meditation when you're going through and sensing the bodies. Many of those sensations, very, very subtle, very neutral. And then there is choosing that starts to happen, some sort of selection, some sort of gravitation towards. This is all within the unconscious, the very deep subconscious level of the arising of consciousness. Intention some sort of subtle intention, which means some sort of subtle motivation and attention. So we talk a lot about attention in meditation, mindfulness and attention. The attention is that wakefulness, that awareness, that pause, that opening. Then when we start to get into a level of consciousness where it is, we are actually in connection, there has to be some sort of interest, something going on there that's bringing us in. And this creates then the orientation. So like with the young boy in the forest where he suddenly became conscious, he became interested in that sound. The rest of it he's conscious but in a bit of a blur and where to do and what to do, you know, is, unclear. Then there is that interest. He hears something. Wow, what's that? Something I might say, something you might read, something that brings you deeper into the Dharma is because of that interest, that curiosity that takes you from just being aware to actually the beginning of becoming awake. And from it, the uh, interest and its orientation, then you have the development of retention, the capacity to retain and for mindfulness to be present. If the mind becomes full of this present situation, becomes full of sort of some the discriminatory wisdom, which is a little bit the interest and the orientation, it starts to develop into something more solid, more real. And then we come on to the, the capacity to develop concentration. But it's only through something becoming more solidified, more cohesive, more connected, where separations fall away, that concentration develops. It's only when the focus becomes so penetrating that discriminations fall away. And then we have the capacity for discernment and wisdom. Now what's very interesting, here's discernment right at the other end. We talked about the young 
lady, the young Bodhisattva, who I don't think is a lady, the Myoyo, Myo Myo, she has this discriminating wisdom, but the discriminating is slightly different to a discerning wisdom. We often mix all these words. But actually, these words are slightly different. A discernment, a discernment's taking it all in. It's not necessarily slicing it away. It's taking it in. Ah, and that. It's not pushing it away. It's considering. It's holding. It's embracing. And these are all very important things that the young ox herder had to learn. He had to learn how to discern the behaviours of the ox, the behaviours of his mind, to know what to do. Because the ox is always interested in the greener grass in that paddock next door. Our mind is always interested in something else. You know, I've got this tremendous hungry mind that wants to always find something more interesting. <laughs> At least I have the opportunity to share a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And so what individuals uh, need, what we need in the complementary of, you know, the ultimate, is to bring it back very much, as I always come to and always say, to take that formless insight from the absolute truth and to bring it into a discerning, cognitive and relative understanding. Bring it back home. Use it. What you hear here today is only useful if you are not getting stuck somewhere. Stuck on a, well, that doesn't sound very, as I say, very Theravada or very this or very that or that doesn't, I haven't heard that one before, you know. We get stuck. We can get stuck in the ultimate craving for samadhi, for emptiness, selflessness, formlessness. I was very stuck on my mountain, I can tell you. Not very happy when, you know, the, the mountain hikers who were, 500 meters down the mountain from me were walking past. It was like I could hear every foot, foot step, you know. <laughs> oh, here they come again. It must be Sunday. <laughs> so I was very stuck in a way, you know, very happy to be in that place. And then I can also be very stuck where I am now. in my little world, my little pond of pleasures, we often get very stuck, sometimes very lonely in that too. Hmm. I had another small analogy here, it's nearly time. Um, when we look at a very large stately tree, very large tree, I have seen them from time to time. I was <coughs> planning to go and see one they had said was in the uh, King Lake Mountains, um, very deep into the mountains. And it, everyone who had seen it, which were very few people, uh, said it was so large that they were sure it was there many hundreds of years. And before I got to actually, you know, make the effort to go to see it, it was gone. Apparently it showed up in the um, aerial photos from the bushfires the tree had burnt. And, um, but I know when I've stood near something so, so large of life, like a very beautiful large tree, knowing it's been there hundreds of years. You know, that sense of insignificance around it and yet in awe of it, 
in awe of that power, that solidity, that straightness, that authenticity. You know, it doesn't worry about the elements coming and ripping a limb off. It stays upright. A lot of my trees on my property, the, uh, the lightnings <laughs> had taken the top off them. And one of them, I used to have one I called the matriarch and, and the patriarch. And the patriarch survived, but the matriarch got a fire down. Could, didn't see it for a few days until the whole top came off. Burnt the inside out anyway. She's growing again. But they were very, they'd been there a very long time. And, uh, and I often used to just go and sit next to them. And when you sit under such a tree, you feel the samadhi of that tree. But it's not an emptiness. It's not a nothingness. There's so much life in that. You can feel the roots going right down into the depth and this sheer mass going up. And it makes you sit and feel very straight and very tall. And I'm always very a little bemused when I see someone's gone and sculpted their name in the bottom of a tree, <laughs> which we, I haven't done it myself, but I have family and friends who have. <laughs> that part of us that, you know, wants to uh, instate authority over this. So in our lives, there are things that are very conducive for our meditation and that depth, like a retreat or like a, a quiet place. And they're very important because so much of our life is a little bit like the young boy who is running wild looking for that ox. We're looking for meaning in life. We're looking for clarity and purpose and wisdom. And it's always there right in front of you. If we stop long enough to see it. <coughs> the young boy exhaustion to finally sit down and anybody who has got to that place in their workplace and has said enough I'm not putting up with this anymore. And they sit with that. It's very interesting. The path becomes very clear. What to do next is very clear. How to live your life in more openness and respect and love becomes very apparent. But we have to stop at times. So maybe enough of my mouth. So I say my lips just do this and <laughs> the wind does the rest. <laughs> Is there any questions? Are there any questions? Anyone got a good topic for today's talk? <laughs> yes. You have a question? I thought somebody said, I do. Oh, telling me. Siri's not available. That's what it kept telling me. <laughs> mm. This is probably a topic to some of those analogies and images to sink in. Yes. The words... And the, um, well, the wisdom comes, of course, from understanding. And then you have the Manjushri's great wisdom, which is very high and very noble and very lofty and very complete. Then you have our discriminatory wisdom, which is more mundane and everyday and dealing with all those little problems that arise for us in life. Yeah. 
So I hope that you can take this with you and contemplate it over the next while, however long. <laughs> yes. I, I think I get the distinction between discerning and discriminating or discriminative. Mm. Could you just explain it a tiny bit more though? Hmm. When we discriminate, when we place our mind, you know, discriminating has a, a, several things happening. One is we discriminate with the view of liking it. So the wisdom is, the wisdom for that is attracted because there's something there I'm attracted to, I like it. And then there is the discernment of negating what it is we don't like. The, sorry, the discrimination of what it is I don't like. And so when I don't like something, I with, withdraw, I pull away, I separate myself. Sometimes we don't uh, really know why we don't like something. Have you ever walked down the street and you find yourself smile at somebody? and then look away from another? Yes. Is it an expression? Is it, is it a personality or a people type? You know, we're attracted to the ones that look smart and have money and look business-like because that's what I do, you know, or we're attracted to those who look holy and spiritual and <laughs> like me. <laughs> Oh, we're attracted to the hippies that, you know, seem to have a free life. And we all have this very discriminative and it's quite deeply embedded in the way we think and the way we have been educated, even embedded from the way our parents, you know, like if my mother didn't like something and always said, oh, no, that's really yucky, when we're a young child, we can grow up never having tasted and think it's yucky until we actually have a spoonful and go, oh, that's really quite nice, you know. <laughs> but then you have what is very neutral, very difficult to place um, a discrimination. It's usually not a discrimination then. It becomes a discernment. It becomes, so even within that which we like or dislike, there the discernment is where we are considering all the benefits of the initial attraction. So we discern, we're not just going for, we discern, yes, do I really need to have my fourth dessert? <laughs> looks good you know you, you, you at some of the smorgasbords we have here <laughs> and the same with you know well <clears throat> what is it about this that you know I don't particularly fancy or like and then there is a, a discerning mind that's inquiring. This is a very important part of our tradition. We develop the discernment beyond good and bad, beyond liking. The discerning way is very much a middle way. It's a way to um, allow things to come into your presence. And then when naturally go, when the, you know, the karmas of attachments not there. For a Buddha, most they have very great discernment. You know, they they can be with be with a lot. For us, we can be with a certain amount. You know, we can tolerate a certain amount. So discernment has many fa facets to it: inquiry, tolerance, patience, endurance. All these capacities of being with and uh, 
and nurturing is another facet. You know, a parent may find one, uh, one of their children, the little children, quite a difficult child. They can either reject that child, even unconsciously, always be attracted to the loving one. Yeah. Or they may actually um, find a discernment about, you know, what that relationship is about. Why is the child behaving like that? Why am I behaving like that? Mm. Absolutely. And being aware of those other discriminatory aspects are very important. Mm. Thank so thank you. Thank you and I thank you for your generosity. You, every little donation always helps our centre. We're getting along and nearly finished. <laughs> I keep saying that every month. But uh, thank you very much and um, appreciated all your support in the past. <laughs>